Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 60 of the NC DWI Guy podcast. On today's podcast, we are continuing our five part series on attacking the breath test. Dr. Evans is back on with us again on today's podcast. Um, Dr. Evans was on last week talking with us about understanding the science behind breath testing. Um, uh, if you want to go back and listen to that before you listen to this episode, that's probably going to be helpful in terms of understanding specifically the topic of today, as well as understanding the credentials that Dr. Evans has on this subject. Um, but Dr. Evans, it's a pleasure to have you back on again today. And we are excited to be talking about the ECIR2. This is going to be, I think, an incredibly powerful episode for anybody that does um, uh, DWI cases because this is the primary witness um, against your client in, uh, in most DWI cases. So it's, it's good to have an understanding of what's going on under the hood of the state's primary witness. So thanks again for coming on to speak with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Background with the ECIR2 you have had the opportunity, and if, if you're watching on video, you can see that Dr. Evans has the ECIR2 device uh, sitting behind him. So tell us the, the process maybe of getting that device and a little bit about kind of what your um, you know, experience has been in terms of using the ECIR2. Sure. So it has been a big adventure trying to uh, get this instrument. Um, I had been trying for years to get one so I could uh, see how it works and play around with it. I had gone to um, a police conference and talked to one of the sales reps for Intoximeter and they said, oh, sure, we can get you one of these, no problem. And then I called up Intoximeter and they said, um, you're not a police officer, so no, we're not going to give it to you. <laughs> See, the salespeople, yeah. they're trying to get it into the hands. Right. They're trying to make the, make the money, but Intoximeter is not about to, uh, to sell that to just anybody. No, and it's weird because these instruments are not just used by police. They're also used by companies that have um, employees that fall under the Department of Transportation drug testing. So like truck drivers and things like that, or contract um, companies that will test, you know, truck drivers or airline pilots and things like that. So I think if I would have initially approached them as, hey, I've got some truck drivers working for me and I want one of these machines, they <laughs> might have given it to me. But unfortunately, I didn't. And I... I'm pretty sure what that they have a database of people that they blacklist because every time I have called after that initial one, they get very defensive and very mad at me. <laughs> and uh, so I'm sure I know I'm not the only one. There's another scientist that I've been talking to about this. And he said, yeah, he's been blacklisted by Intoximeter as well. So, yeah, and again, you know, we, we had talked a little bit about this in, in the uh, last episode about kind of the proprietary information that they kind of try to, um, you know, keep from, from uh, you, know, you know, other than police departments, police agencies, and, and kind of the, um, you know, some of these companies that are using it for evaluation purposes. This is not something that they really want to have a lot of looking under the hood. So that's why, right. you know, I think, you know, just having a better understanding of what's going on on the machine, having the opportunity to, to look at the device, you know, I, I feel like for a, for a juror, one of the most like important parts of explaining scientific information, and I would say this is true for attorneys as well. We, most of us don't have a, a whole lot of background in science 
is trying to visualize what this device is doing, right? Again, it just seems like this complete unknown. We know the test ticket that gets printed out of it. We may have seen a picture, but I feel like having visuals both to better understand it ourselves. So whether that's kind of of the internal components and getting kind of a basic understanding of how those things connect and what is happening with the device, or in terms of, you know, visually kind of seeing what it looks like when it's being utilized, you know, as close as we typically would get would be some sort of body cam video of a officer and client in the intox room and the, you know, officer, you know, uh, punching the keys on the keyboard and asking the person to blow um, at the end of the observation period. So again, yeah, w- w- whatever, whatever you want to kind of talk about in terms of your, um, you know, overall findings of the machine, whether it's the, the kind of technology component or the way that the, um, you know, machine uh, analyzes these things, it'd be, be really helpful. Yeah, and I, I plan on doing some, uh, a series of videos about it where it's hands-on and I'm showing how to use it. We'll crack it open and open up the case and you can see the guts of it and everything. That's great. Um, yeah, really when, you, when you do that, when you have those videos ready, just let us know. We'll, we'll definitely share that on the podcast in terms of where, where the audience can go to find those on your website because that would be awesome. Sure, yeah. It, it is such a problem that the, the company seems so secretive because in the world of science, that, that's completely the opposite attitude. You know, a scientist will run a study, they'll show some information, they'll publish it so that everybody can see what they did, how they did it, and the results that they got. And I I think it's funny that Intoximeter is headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri, um, which is the show me state, and they seem to not embrace that. And it's more like the trust me state is what uh, Intoximeter is saying. Yeah. And I I think that that's, it's such a wild, a wild thing to think about, right? Because basically you have this information that is being utilized, maybe not the ECR2 specifically, but breath testing devices are being utilized, you know, across the country to get convictions in criminal cases there. I mean, these machines are not cheap. If you are allowed to purchase one, they're not by any means a, a cheap machine to buy. And so, you know, there is just, you know, millions of dollars that are, are behind kind of the, um, the, you know, the, the, the push to get these machines out and being able to be utilized by agencies and the buy-in from agencies. But again, in terms of the inner workings, that is not being then communicated really in a meaningful way to the public, which can then be communicated to the, to the jury so we can kind of see whether or not there is a a kind of legitimacy um, to these being kind of the primary means of getting a conviction in a DWI case. So again, I I think just having that, you know, hands-on experience is such a value point in terms of just better understanding the science, because it's only once you kind of are, are able to get in there and start kind of doing your own experiments and testing that we can kind of, you know, hopefully start to see exactly um, you know, where there could be, you know, inconsistencies, accuracy issues. Um, so again, yeah, you, you kind of just uh, let us know, Dr. Evans, what you've kind of found on this front in terms of any of the experiments that you've run or just in terms of kind of uh, looking at the machine. I'm, I'm uh, definitely very interested to, to get your intake on it. Yeah, it, it's, I'll just drop back to the story of, of getting this one for a second. Um, so I even tried without having an instrument myself to get intoximeter to teach me because they also have training classes. And at first they, they said, sure, we can teach you. Um, and that was even for the Department of Transportation type of test, not the police test. And then it got closer to the time um, of the test, of the training and I, No, I think I had asked them if they would train me and they initially said, yeah, they would. And then they came back and said, no, we're not going to train you at all. So I spent years trying to find one of these, uh, looking at eBay and uh, different government auction sites. Um, 
it was probably, I would guess at five years that I finally found one on eBay. Uh, it came from a university and I got it and it came with absolutely nothing. There were no user manuals, no information on how to use it. Um, so I pretty much just tried to, had to learn from my own. Um, I got several different operator manuals from different police agencies that you can get on the, the website, uh, on the internet, but they all seem to lack a lot of information. Um, so I got the basics down and it was really confusing to me because they would talk about calibrating the instrument and they never really said how they do that. So I, I couldn't quite figure it out. And I saw in one of the police operator manuals where it was, where it did mention about calibrating the instrument and it said um, that you use a dry gas bottle, which is one of these that's going to contain uh, alcohol and nitrogen gas at a known concentration. And it said, you run this through the instrument and uh, then it's calibrated. Well, this only contains one concentration of alcohol. So I kept thinking, you know, this can't be right. You can't calibrate an instrument on one concentration. That's just not a calibration. So I kept thinking, I've got to be missing something. And when you say one, one uh, you're talking about 1% alcohol? Is that what, what the... Uh... Uh, they usually do it at 0 0.08, so right at the per se limit. Okay. So they will take the machine, they'll run this gas through it, It'll read 0.08, and they'll say um, it's calibrated. We know that it can measure 0.08. The problem is that's not a calibration. What a calibration is, is you need to measure really at least five different concentrations of alcohol to get to know that the instrument is accurate throughout that range. So it could detect 0 0.001 up to 0.2 or 0.3. And then all in between so that, so, so when, know, when you, when you, when you, just, just to break that down for a minute so, so that I can make sure I'm understanding. So um, what would be helpful in terms of calibrating would be to have canisters that almost had like different quantities of uh, alcohol concentration so that you, you know, what, what you're expecting the device to read would be with regard to this canister, a 0 0.03 with regard to this canister, a 0 0.07 with regard to this canister, a 0.15 so that you can make exactly. sure it's detecting all of those um, different uh, uh, canisters at the appropriate alcohol concentration. Right. Okay. And, and that's what you need to do in order to make sure that you're getting accurate readings anywhere outside of 0.08. Okay. So what so you So the really, device is calibrated to 0.08 and really to kind of no other specific point is that is that a fair way to Yeah, think exactly. About it? Okay. So if you're a 0.08, sorry, that thing's pretty accurate. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. Right, gotcha. Okay. Um but the but even at the minimum if you were to to say 0.1 and 0.05. You could then, you know, calibrate between those two uh, concentrations and anything that measured was measured in between those, you would say, okay, it's, it's fairly accurate because it's been calibrated to that. But as soon as you get past where it's been calibrated to, uh, then you're pretty much just estimating that you think you know what that concentration is. Okay. But you can't prove it because it wasn't within the concentration range that it's been calibrated to. So it was, it was my thought that because I could only find a limited amount of information about the machine and intoximeter will not talk to me, um, 
that I was missing something. That somewhere there is a document saying, this is how you really calibrate it. You have five different concentrations and this is the steps that you go through it. But I never found that and I found uh, several statements that were in these operator manuals where it says, oh, you just need a one point calibration at 0.08. And that just completely floored me. So apparently that is how they calibrate the machine. They just take one point at 0.08, they test it, and then they're done. So if you get a measurement, anything above or below, you really don't know how accurate that is. And that's a major problem. That makes this um, a, a very poor detection instrument. Basically, it's designed to determine if someone is at the per se limit, and that's about it. Okay. It won't tell you much beyond that. Okay. So, um, there are ways that you can calibrate it beyond that, but I don't think that the, I don't think that that's being done. Because even when I run through the calibration menu on my instrument, it'll just have one little uh, section that'll say, do you want to use a dry gas, which is the compressed gas or a wet bath which is where you take a known liquid concentration of alcohol and put it in this, it vaporizes it and can go through the instrument. And beyond that, that's really the only, well, you have to tell it what concentration your reference standard is uh, set to. So if it's a 0.08, then you would put in 0.08. Other than those two things, that's pretty much all that you can input into the machine and then it'll do its calibration based on that one thing. And in terms of that kind of um, sample, so whether it's the, the, the dry canister or the wet bath, um, in North Carolina, are you, do you know which is, is it used? Is it the wet bath that they use in North Carolina? I think, um, I don't know 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that they typically use the dry gas just because it's integrally built into the machine. There's okay. a little compartment to hold it. Okay. I do know though that a wet bath is possible because the law does specify uh, what the reference standard would be if you used a wet bath. And, and what that, would be the difference? And is, is there advantages or disadvantages to using either one of those in calibration? So the, the dry gas is nice because you just plug it into the machine, you leave it plugged in, you don't have to do anything. And when you need it, you use it. Um, when you don't, it sits there and nothing happens. With the, the wet bath, you know, you're putting water and alcohol in here. You can keep it in here, they say, for... Um, I believe four months. I could be wrong on that, but I know it's at um, 125 tests. So you can have one solution and run 125 tests before you need a new solution. So basically this would just be sitting around and you know, it's not sterile. You could probably get mold and bacteria growing in here if you're letting that sit around for four months. So I think it's just a lot cleaner and easier to use the dry gas. Okay. Um, the dry gas is also used during the testing um, sequence as what they call a calibration check. So if they're using the dry gas to calibrate the instrument and using the exact same dry gas to check their calibration, it all you really get is information that the instrument has a high precision in detecting whatever concentration that is in the bottle. 
the way to really do that would be to use two different uh, concentrations or two different lots of gas or wet bath so that um, you calibrate it on one test with another that's just slightly off and then you can get information on how accurate your reference materials are to each other. Right. So like, say you get one of these gas canisters and something's wrong with it. For whatever reason, it's inaccurate. You calibrate the machine to it. Each time you check the calibration, you're using the same bottle. So everything's going to look fine on the instrument, but because there's something wrong with that bottle, you'll never know it. And every single test you use until it's recalibrated with the new bottle will be off. Okay. Um, so we were talking in the other uh, episode before this about the partition coefficient. And that, um, that really is something that comes into play with the wet bath. Uh, alcohol simulator. So you've got water and alcohol in here. Uh, you don't fill it up all the way so that there's a little bit of headspace for the alcohol to vaporize, vaporize into here. So there are several things that can affect the partition ratio as to how much alcohol is going to go into the vapor phase versus the liquid phase. So the state, the law says in North Carolina that you have to use distilled water and uh, distilled water is not the same as blood. Um, blood has salts, it has sugars, fats, proteins, and blood cells in it. It's a very complex uh, composition and that composition changes um, all the time. It stays within normal ranges um, Otherwise, people start getting sick, but it's definitely not the same as distilled water. So the partition coefficient is partly um, influenced by the solubility of the ethanol to the water. So if you change how soluble that is in the water, you're going to change the concentration in the air. So I used my instrument and tested distilled water and alcohol, uh, salt water and alcohol, a water that contained um, a fatty solution. It's really like a soap uh, type of thing, uh, but that to mimic fat, uh, triglycerides and cholesterol in the blood. And then I also tested um, sugar. And this was, honestly, it was just table sugar, which is not what you find in blood. You find glucose, but it was just a tried out. And when you add the salt, the breath alcohol concentration went up a little bit. When you added the, the fatty soap, it actually went down. So the fact that they're measuring this in distilled water, um, it is one bias that's already built into how the machine is, is used if they're using the wet bath system. And then it also translates into a, a human. So that means that the partition coefficient or partition ratio and how much alcohol is in your breath is going to change depending on your blood chemistry. If you've recently eaten, um, uh, especially a big fatty meal that could alter it. If you're dehydrated and your salt concentration is increased, that could change it. Um, I was looking at the sugars to see if maybe a person who's diabetic could alter it. And I actually didn't see much of a change for that. Um, but so just to let you know what amounts have changed, they weren't huge. Um, but this was just a small experiment. Um, I basically took uh, six measurements 
And with the alcohol and distilled water, I was getting 0 0.064 to 0 0.063. So it was pretty tight and close for each measurement within the same solution. When you add the salt, it was, um, I added the amount of salt based on the normal range of sodium that is found in people's blood that would be reported in like a clinical laboratory test. So to try to simulate blood and that was at 0 0.066. So it only went up 0 0.02, um, but if you're right at that level, right at that limit, uh, that could make a difference. Then I tried to simulate someone who was uh, dehydrated where maybe they had um, a much higher salt concentration. This was about four times the normal sodium levels in blood. That went up to 0 0.027. So there you're, you're getting almost a 0 0.01 change not quite but almost um, just based on salt so it can make a difference um, and I think it's something to to look into for your defense because obviously the police officer is not measuring the blood composition of the person They're right just putting them through the machine and, and I mean it's just interesting to see how much you could change just in that kind of uh, wet bath formula where you do at least have to some extent a um, uh, kind of constant pressure and temperature between experiments. Uh, anyways, I mean, even, right. if it, even if it's not kind of the, you know, th there's some sort of other temperature issues that could be going on with the machine itself in terms of heating up appropriately or whatnot. I mean, you can't necessarily control that, but at least um, you've got the, you know, constant pressure um going on and as you know assume assume kind of a similar temperature so it just is so uh, uh wild that there would be that much of a discrepancy even when everything else kind of remains unchanged right and it was it went in the other direction with the um the fats so this was uh lecithin which is kind of like a a cooking soap an edible soap and uh, that made it drop down to 0 0.061 um, based on a triglyceride level of, um, I forgot. It was within the normal range, but a high triglyceride level. Um, so I wouldn't say that if you get pulled over, you should go, you know, eat a bunch of grease or something, but that <laughs> definitely helped. <laughs> Yeah, There's that's... something I really want to try that I, I haven't yet. Um, so the partition ratio is heavily influenced by temperature. The body temperature is 37 degrees about. It changes for each person and changes throughout the day based on circadian rhythm and physical activity. And then you've got the breath temperature. So you're, you're bringing in air from the outside uh, most people, it's coming through the nose. The nose is really good at warming that air up to get to body temperature. And then the air goes down into the lungs. And the whole time it's getting drawn in, it's warming up. And it's getting conditioned so that you don't damage your lungs. But apparently it doesn't get up to 37. It doesn't actually equalize to the body core temperature. So that's why um, uh, the breathalyzers are set to read a breath temperature of 34 degrees centigrade instead of 37. So what I wanna try is an experiment where if you have an, uh, a change in environmental temperature, how well does that affect your breath temperature? So right. if you're measuring a uh, breath test in say Arizona and, and it's 110 degrees, Right, you're probably gonna get something different than if you're up in Alaska and it's minus 10 degrees. Right. So. And that could make definitely a big difference in a situation where you've got like the mobile 
um, breath testing units that are, you know, at a, at a checkpoint or something along those lines that, you know, conditions are outside, you know, they're, you're, you're much closer, but even, even within a police station or a jail where a breath testing unit is housed, if the air conditioning is running or, you know, dysfunctional, whatever it might be, I mean, that would certainly change those environmental conditions. Well, even, I mean, the whole point is the machine assumes that your breath temperature is 34 degrees centigrade. It doesn't measure it. So it's always going to be just a guess. Was it really 34? Did the person have a fever? Did their circadian rhythm just be at a point where it's not at 34? Is their normal temperature just a little bit lower than 34? I mean, everybody is different. So just using average values as the set point or how that machine assumes that you are means that pretty much every time it's going to be wrong because right. not everybody is average. The vast majority is not average. Right. Well, and, and you know, it's not even, even the average person, like you, like you just said, you, the, the machine is kind of taking into account the, the difference in the person's body temperature versus their lung temperature, so to speak. I mean, so there, there's, there's kind of an assumption built in, even in terms of, um, even if you knew the average of people's body temperature, lung temperature could fluctuate a lot more than body temperature likely would just based on environmental conditions, you know, uh, uh, time of day, what the person has been doing in terms of movement, exercise, that type of thing. So, um, yeah. a much, much kind of wider range of temperature difference than would, would be the actual body temperature differences between people. And it could it, actually, I would imagine, I haven't tested this, but it would probably be changed by whether or not someone is breathing through their nose or breathing through their mouth. So if you, right. cause the nose is like this spongy cavernous, uh, sinuses where it, got lots of contact with blood that's flowing through it so it's going to heat up the air much more efficiently than if you're breathing through your mouth so say someone has a cold and their nose is stuffed you know it could alter uh the results just based on that yeah one, one thing that i've i've i heard somebody mention this one time and i don't i don't know if there's any uh any legitimacy to this so maybe, maybe this is one to like put down i don't know how you'd really like be able to document this in terms of scientific research, but um, you know, even in terms of like clearing out your lungs, if you like taking a a lot of very deep breaths kind of before doing the breath testing versus if you were to, um, you know, just kind of be either breathing normally or shallow breaths uh, before doing the testing, if it's kind of going for that deep lung sample, if you're getting that air out kind of prior to doing the actual breath test with, you know, several large breaths, deep breaths right before breath testing. I'd be curious to see if that would change the sample in any meaningful way as well. Oh, that definitely does. Yeah. We didn't talk about that yet, but yeah, your breathing pattern uh, alters it quite a bit. Um, I've uh, hyperventilated right before I did the, the test and it definitely goes down quite a bit. Um, if you hold your breath, it will go up and it's kind of interesting because I've seen some videos where police officers will say they're given instructions on how to, um, to the suspect on how to do the testing. And they'll say, you know, I want you to take a deep breath in and hold it for a few seconds and then blow. So Mm -hmm. that holding it for a few seconds is terrible that you don't want to do that right right interesting Um, and so that's an artificial inflation of the the alcohol concentration that's yeah that's pretty wild i've never kind of listened to that specific language in terms of the testing i'll definitely start to be a little bit more clued in on that if that's being kind of communicated because i would assume that that's from experience that that is uh that's being done since there's, you know, so many trainings for officers that allow for um, breath testing to be done. I would assume that there's, there's opportunities for that, uh, that type of on right. the spots, you know, uh, experimentation to, to be, <laughs> to be done in real time. <laughs> but um, well, yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of just the, 
the, the, you know, breakdown of the process, you know, from the test ticket side of things, the first thing that kind of pops up on the test 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 ticket is the diagnostics check. So what does that, you know, what does that look like? Have you been able to do anything in terms of uncovering what is occurring during that diagnostics check, or has there not kind of been the appropriate kind of like manual, um, to be able to kind of read into what exactly is occurring during that diagnostics check? That's, that's really been one of these black boxes. Um, cause it, it basically just says it passed a systems right. check. It doesn't entirely tell you what it did. Um, there is a way that you can get in and see, um, the temperature of different components of the instrument and, um, you can look at the signals of the infrared detector and the fuel cell, but I haven't really been able to pull that information out in any meaningful way yet. Okay. Um, but, you know, what I would love to do is find someone who's basically a hacker who can uh, pull the code off of this thing and, and find out what it's actually doing. Th so, there you go. So if you have any, any hackers, any, any there. computer skills, <laughs> if you, if you have computer skills, call Dr. Evans, he's in the, yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so, so we kind of talked a little bit about the accuracy check, which would be kind of like the next part of the um, test, test tick, uh, test ticket process in terms of what's going on. Um, maybe an air blank before that, but um, uh, you know, th that, that accuracy check is then either pulling from the uh, dry canister or from the wet bath. Um, anything in addition to what we've already talked about that could be problematic in terms of the accuracy check portion? Um, well, first what I want to say is there is one really good advantage that um, this machine has that I wish um, the blood tests would do. And that's that they do a blank check between all samples. So they, they first run through their systems check, then they will run a blank check, show that there's no alcohol in the system. And they'll run their calibration check. And just just in terms of that air blank, that's that uh, that's happening. It, it that's just basically purging. Is it the fuel cell or or um, what what components is that air blank actually kind of purging? It's gonna pull the fan is actually at the end of the whole thing, so it's pulling air throughout the whole system. So it's gonna okay. go into the infrared detector, okay. into the fuel cell into the pressure sensor, the whole thing. So if you've got um, any carryover, so say you've got someone who blows really high, like a 0.3, it's possible that the next time uh, that the machine runs, that some of that alcohol could still be in the machine and get detected on the next blow. Right. But because they purge through and run a blank check between each one, if that does happen, you would know it and okay. it would tell you. So that's something that blood tests don't do. Really, they will run maybe 50 samples um, and they might have one or two blanks um, at the beginning of those 50 samples or one or two at the end and then nothing in between so that right. if your blood sample is run right after some, someone who can, you know, chug a, a quart of alcohol and they're up to a 0.03, I mean a 0.3, some of that could bleed into your sample and make you become positive even though you didn't have any alcohol at all. So if that happens in a blood test, there's no way that they can tell because they don't okay. look for it. So I don't want to say everything's bad with the instrument. That is really important. And it would be nice if the, the blood tests were done with that. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but there, there definitely are problems 
uh, with the instrument. So basically the breakdown of it is it makes assumptions that each person who uses the instrument is the average person. Right. So partition coefficients and uh, temperatures are all probably not what your client is. Um, they're probably all off and um, it can't really tell that what it's measuring is actually ethanol. Um, now they will, the manufacturers will argue that their fuel cell system is specific for ethanol and nothing else in the breath is gonna set it off. But the, the system that they use, a fuel cell is using a platinum coated disc to cause a chemical reaction where the platinum is like a, it's a catalyst like in your catalytic converter that converts carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide so you don't die from car exhaust. It's the same principle. In fact, they use platinum and catalytic converters as well. So they claim that this is so specific, only ethanol is going to uh, react with it, but that there's no there's nothing to make that real, I suppose. Like if you've got an immunoassay, you've got an antibody that the shape of that antibody is specific for the shape of whatever drug you're looking for. So you know that only things that have this kind of a shape should bind to that antibody, but there's nothing like that in a fuel cell. Um, and so in terms of other things that could give off that kind of same, um, uh, kind of, I, I guess, electro, it, what, what, what is it get, giving off then as it's going through the, the fuel cell, what, what kind of, you know, as it's being converted to, is it an electron? Yeah. You're, you're basically just reading an electrical signal. The chemical reaction occurs with the ethanol. It, produces electrons which then travel to the other side of the fuel cell and those electrons react with oxygen in the air to form water um, and it's that electron flow that's producing an electrical current and that signal is what the instrument reads as um, alcohol. So, so what other chemicals could then kind of cause a similar electrical signal? Well the the only thing that I believe they're required to test it against is acetone. So the, um, the federal government, I want to say NHTSA is in charge of certifying breathalyzers to be evidentiary breathalyzers. Okay. And their requirement in terms of specificity is just that it can detect ethanol and that it will not, that acetone up to a certain concentration will not show up on the instrument. So it's even to the point where it's not saying it will never detect acetone if you dump a bunch of acetone in there. According to the standards, it's allowed to detect that and treat it as if it was ethanol. Okay. Um, but other than that, you know, there's other components um, that you really would have to test to make sure that it, it doesn't read that. I've seen um, Intoximeter cited this little study where it looked at some chemicals, um, things like, well, it was a, a whole mix of different chemicals like benzene and isopropanol. Um, and it showed, oh, it didn't, didn't measure most of those, although it did measure a couple things like isopropanol, which is another alcohol and methanol. But, you know, one thing that I would want to test is um, ketone bodies because those are produced and people who are diabetic, if they're undergoing uh, ketone acidosis, 
they start to produce these ketone bodies. Um, it would be nice to see if that gets picked up by the machines. Um, and maybe I'll run those experiments and find out. Yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely be interesting to see. I mean, with, uh, with the ability to actually put all this into practice, again, it's just kind of, you know, the, the, like we said at the beginning of the conversation, this mentality of trust me when it comes to the right. device is just such a, such a wild, you know, uh, wildly against scientific principles that, that, you know, the, the jury should be relying on it should be, we've kind of tested this against everything. We've allowed, you know, scientists and all kinds of different backgrounds to, to test this, the, um, the information is out there and, and, you know, the, this is is doing exactly what it um, purports to do. Um, in yeah, terms, they, go, should go be ahead. Pr- they should be proud of what they have. They should say, "This is our instrument. This is our product, and it's this accurate." So go out and test it, and we're so confident that you're going to find it's accurate that you know we don't care. Right. But that's completely the opposite track that they take. Right, exactly. Yeah, and you know, I, I think even in terms of the um, trying to get that information in front of the jury, we, we kind of talked towards the end of the last um, uh, call about um, you know kind of the importance of having an expert witness. I think even kind of walking through the story in a cross examination or a direct examination of, of, of you in particular, but anybody else that has, has actually finally been able to get a, their hands on this kind of to walk through how difficult it was to get access to the device to test would be important for the jury to hear that this is not something that is being put out there with that kind of, you know, bold, confident, um, uh, uh, you know, scientific, background it's it's we're going to hide everything you know not give anybody access to test this we don't want anybody to have the um you know the code the knowledge the you know uh, access to to look you know at the components of the the device and so i think all of that would be helpful for a juror um to to take into account we had talked a little bit i think on the uh the the last call too uh about uh, mouth alcohol and how the device is kind of reading um, uh, mouth alcohol. So you were basically kind of talking about as, as the sample is uh, going in, if there's kind of a spike in the um, alcohol concentration at the beginning of the breath sample, that could potentially trigger a mouth alcohol um, uh, uh, result and, and basically, you know, kind of a, a lockout period on the, the device or a, a, you know, printed test ticket that says mouth alcohol detected. What does that, what does that look like? Or have you been able to kind of look at anything related to the mouth alcohol? Actually? Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I forgot about mentioning this. So I was just testing some things. Um, I didn't, um, didn't really pick up on this on purpose. But when I was doing um, the testing with the salts and the fats and the sugar and using the wet bath, what happened was every time I had a new, uh, a new solution and I would blow into the machine with the wet bath, um, I would get the first very first reading would come back as mouth alcohol. And I could see that because you're basically getting a constant concentration of alcohol pumped into the machine. So there's no increase with time like you would see with um, breath. So I could see that. And the reason it happened is I think um, I was doing this as if I were blowing into the instrument with a regular sample. So I was using the same hose that you would use um, if you're going through the test and I just connected it to there and blew through that. The initial test came back as mouth alcohol, but then there was no waiting period. And in fact, it 
kicked me back to start the test again using all the same information that I had already put in. So if this was the same uh, suspect, all that information would be in the machine and I could immediately test again. So there was no lockout. And the weird thing was I would do it again and the second time it would go through without any problem. Yeah, that so, is interesting. And every time I changed the solution, so you gotta open this thing up, <coughs> put her in new solution, put it back in, and I would hook it back up, I would get mouth alcohol as the first test. But then every test after that, it was fine and it would read it and give me a number. So I don't really understand how it is judging the mouth alcohol. You know, it should be, I'm blowing in the same sample each time. It should be, if it's going to detect that as mouth alcohol, every time should be mouth alcohol. Yes, Why did it yeah. then let me take a sample? So then I thought, well, that's really weird. Maybe maybe it's programmed to say, hey, that's mouth alcohol. Uh, but you should know better and wait for 15, 20 minutes. And then you can still do it. Like it just doesn't not lock you out. But then it says, oh, well, apparently you've waited long enough so you can measure it. I don't know. I'm just guessing at how this program. So then I just took a little sip of vodka and swished it around in my mouth and blew it in the machine. And I got an interesting result because the first time it, w it just said high. It was, there was too much alcohol in it. Okay. It was over 0.4. So that's expected. So then I did it again and it took a measurement um, once and gave me a reading. I tried it again and the mouth alcohol had gotten out of my mouth. It was no longer there. So it read a zero. So I said, okay, I'm going to try this again. So I put some more. So, so when you, when mouth. you, just to go through that kind of specific, um, you know, experiment, the, the first time it read after you'd switched the bike around the sub, the subtest basically said hi, man, basically didn't give any, any reading. The second right. subtest gave a numerical result. Yes. Okay. And so then the third subtest zero. Right. Okay. So that second one, it didn't detect it as mouth alcohol. And how long was Even it after you exactly had done the like swishing around in your mouth before that like second subtest, like approximately? Maybe two or three minutes, I okay. think. Okay. So pretty close. I mean, definitely within that 15 minute time frame then. Yeah. Okay. So then I tried to repeat this and um, because the first one was just too much alcohol, I mixed it in with a, um, a, another drink and took some of that. And then every single time after that, it would just say mouth alcohol and it wouldn't give me a reading. But it's weird because those first couple tests it would still read after it would say either mouth alcohol or too much when I knew exactly that it was mouth alcohol because right. I put right. it in my mouth. Right, right. So that is interesting. I, something's not entirely correct with how it measures mouth alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that the, the, the big, uh, probably the biggest place where that comes up is for, um, in, in terms of practice is for somebody that is, you know, either, um, you know, burping or, or, you know, uh, putting something in, into their mouth that, you know, during this observation period time they're, they're, they're trying to kind of watch out for that, but sp specifically like the burping or kind of like, uh, you know, almost a, a burp where there's like almost a little bit of vomit as well, you know, like some, something where there is that's coming into the mouth. I think that would be where there could be a place of, um, you know, either a higher concentration of, of uh, alcohol reported or, you know, some sort of a variant between the two samples if, if you had that happen in practice. Right. And I, I actually have GERD, which is a gastrointestinal reflux okay. disease. Um, so that's where 
some stomach contents can come up into your esophagus. And it's interesting because it, for me, it's not how the police training says it is. It's not like I'm burping. I don't even know anything's right. happening. Okay. I'm okay. just getting heartburn. Okay. And, uh, um, you know, this is a, a disease where over time it can erode your teeth because acid is getting up into your mouth and uh, eating away at your teeth. So I think you can, you can still get mouth alcohol without having an obvious burp or regurgitation, um, you know, where you're like, oh, well, there's something in my mouth. Right. I think it's, it's more of like a, the, the valve between your stomach and your esophagus is loose and leaky. And just every once in a while, something like pop up and splash up. Okay. Gotcha. And, you know, ethanol is a, a volatile chemical, so it's going to vaporize. Um, I'd, it'd be nice to see how far up some of this uh, – stomach contents would have to go in your esophagus before it gets detected into your mouth. Cause it's actually not the mouth. It would have to get above um, the epiglottis, which is the section of your esophagus where the trachea comes in. So as long as it gets above that, which is not your mouth, um, it would get into your breath as you blow out as the air goes through your trachea. Um, and it's it's an interesting thing I'd I'd like to look into because um, GERD is pretty common. The medications like Pepsid and Tagamet are widely prescribed. All these proton pump inhibitors. It's like a billion of dollar industry. So there's a lot of people out there, and I'm betting there's also lots of people who are not diagnosed. And if it is. Um, if I can prove that, yes, getting some contents up that is not an actual burp or regurgitation can still cause an effect that I think that would be important to find out. Yeah, it would definitely be important to find out. I think that that would be some pretty, um, impactful, impactful science. If that, if that was something that, that could be proven, because I, you know, I think that that, that defense you know, I've heard a lot of clients bring that, bring that up. And I've, um, you know, you know, seen or heard about, you know, cases that, that uh, were tried and this was kind of the defense that was offered, but I don't feel like there's a, a ton of kind of hard and fast science that is readily available to be able to kind of explain the connection between GERD and a potential high or higher alcohol concentration, how much that could kind of, you know, change the sample. And I think that's really right. where the, you know, defense can sometimes break down because when you're kind of presenting that, that GERD issue to a jury, I think a lot of times in the juror's mind, it is almost kind of flipping the burden of proof, you know, has the defense right. shown us that the, you know, sample was impacted by their person's kind of medical makeup, so to speak, physiological makeup versus, you know, again, the state is the one that is responsible for proving that this, you know, sample is what it purports to be. And they haven't kind of excluded GERD as a factor. So it's always kind of a difficult, like, uh, you know, maybe flip of the, the burden, but if you had some real kind of hard and fast evidence to kind of put out there to the jury, you, you know, show that your client has a medical diagnosis and here's what that means. I think that really could change the way that that's perceived by the jury. Well, one little nugget on that is uh, a risk factor for getting um, the reflux, which is the regurgitation is drinking alcohol. So right. right. <laughs> actually drinking it can actually make it happen. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. I think that that's a, a good, a good point of emphasis to know. Um, well, Dr. Evans has been really a powerful, uh, you know, couple of, couple of calls that we've had. Um, I really can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing your scientific background. I think that understanding 
breath testing and understanding the ECR2 is one of the most important parts of uh, defending a case that involves a breath result because you have to be able to understand that in order to bring that to the jury. In terms of um, uh, you know anything that you find experimentation-wise or videos that you share, let us know so that we can share that. And for our audience that would be interested in kind of talking to you as a consultant or having you testify as an expert in a, a case, what is the best means of contacting you on that front? Um, my email is andy.e at toxicologistexpert.com. And then uh, that's the easiest. And then my website is just uh, toxicologistexpert.com. Yeah, great, great resources there as well. So I would uh, encourage anybody that is interested in finding uh, out more about Dr. Evans to take a look at that um, uh, at, uh, at his website. Um, if you have a, a question, uh, definitely, definitely bounce it off. Dr. Evans is, is always good to, to kind of, you know, be in, in uh, pretty easy contact on that front. So I would definitely encourage anybody that has a question on a case to, to reach out and get a, uh, get a take on that front. Um, again, it's been, been a, a tremendous blessing to have some of this scientific knowledge, um, put into terms that we as lawyers can understand and then be able to uh, recommunicate that to the jury. So thank you so much again for coming on. Sure. No problem. Thank you for having me. If you found the information in this podcast to be valuable, I simply ask that you pay it forward and share this podcast with another member of the legal community. Also, if you would leave us a rating or a review on whatever platform you are listening on, I would greatly appreciate it.